Thank you, everyone. As the United States Ambassador to France, it is my great pleasure to introduce the United States Secretary of the Interior, Sally Jewell. A member of President Obama's cabinet, Secretary Jewell leads an agency that manages America's vast natural and cultural resources, including our wonderful national parks and our wildlife refuges. In addition, the Department of Interior's expert scientists and specialists produced cutting edge science through the US Geological Survey and contribute to the development of conventional and regional renewable energy on our most important public lands. Prior to joining the administration, Secretary Jewell served in the private sector, most recently as president and CEO of outdoor retailer REI. Trained as a petroleum engineer, Secretary Jewell started her career in the oil and gas fields of Oklahoma. As secretary, she has made climate change a top priority for the department. As she recently said, even as we act to curb dangerous carbon pollution, we have a moral obligation to prepare communities for the impacts already underway from climate change. She is clearly a leader in the climate fight. As President Obama said when nominating Secretary Jewell, she is an expert on the energy and climate issues that are going to shape our future. So I am thrilled today to introduce Secretary Jewell, a true champion of the climate cause. Thank you, Ambassador Hartley, and uh, thank you all for coming today. I hope you can uh, hear okay, and if you can't for some reason, please let us know over the course of the program and we'll adjust it. We have uh, three panelists that are with us today. Um, two of them are on stage, the other one will be joining us shortly, and I'm going to introduce each of them as they get up to speak. But before I do that, I want to just say a few words on behalf of the United States, our third panelist now joining us. Um, and add my welcome to Tom's to the U.S. Center here at COP21. Uh, it is an incredible group of people that are gathered here, and I'm proud to be part of a very large U.S. delegation that is so committed to the work that all of you are committed to, too, which is making a difference to uh, climate. So the, this particular session is titled Beyond Forests. So we're here to talk about cutting-edge mitigation actions that various countries are taking, not only in forests, but in a host of other landscapes as well. It's very relevant because, as I'm sure you all know, agriculture and deforestation activities are a major source of carbon pollution. The recent IPCC report estimates they account for nearly one quarter of global greenhouse gas emissions today. And that statistic is why every country's COP21 commitments include actions to address emissions from land use in one way or another. Many countries, like the United States, have set forth economy-wide targets that include their land sector. So we're making progress in the United States tackling these issues directly. Uh, and as is happening in the UN through programs like Red Plus, reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. So there's going to be an event here at two, uh, 345 tomorrow to talk about Red Plus specifically. But recently, we've also seen some very innovative approaches to mitigation in other landscapes, from wetlands to agricultural areas to urban communities. These efforts generate benefits beyond just emissions reductions. They help increase resilience and enhance agricultural productivity. But it all begins with measuring. You can't measure, uh, you can't manage what you can't measure. And so part of our obligations at, under the UNFCCC we submit an annual inventory of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions and sinks. And since the release of President Obama's Climate Action Plan, we have made significant progress, improving the land sector inventory and our own capacity to project future emissions and sinks from our land sector. So within the Department of Interior, as the Ambassador mentioned, we have the U.S. Geological Survey, or USGS, and they continue to contribute to an understanding of how and where ecosystems naturally store and sequester carbon. 
They've estimated that U.S. ecosystems in the lower 48 sequester about 474 million tons of carbon a year. That's equivalent to U.S. car emissions for about two years, or 14 percent of our annual uh, carbon emissions. So I'd invite you to take a look at that tool. It's at usgs.gov. It's called the Land Carbon Data Tool. And it underscores the importance of protecting important landscapes and ecosystems. So we're taking that data. Uh, and using it to develop tools that help land managers make informed local and landscape level decisions. And I'll say more broadly, uh, data.gov backslash climate has a number of data sets that can help uh, in this work and we invite private sector innovation in using these data sets to turn them into easy tools that land managers across the world can use. So more than ever before, these tools are giving us an opportunity to pull up and look at our landscapes more holistically so we can make smart decisions on things like wildlife habitat that also, by the way, tends to coincide with carbon sequestration. We can plan for thoughtful development so we're not inadvertently putting a road or a power line or expanding a city into an area that's very critical for um, mitigation of climate and uh, important habitat for animals. So I'm gonna use a couple of examples that I think help illustrate this point. My sister agency, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and my colleague Tom Vilsack will be here over the course of uh, today, has an organization called the National Resources Conservation Service. They invest many, many hundreds of millions of dollars in conservation easements and working with farmers and landowners on voluntary programs to protect landscapes and not develop them. For example, uh, in the middle of the United States, through an area of the Great Plains called the Prairie Potholes, there are wetlands that are critical to bird migrations from the Arctic down to southern climates. And yet they have been drained for agricultural purposes, and also uh, that drainage activity for agriculture has reduced their capacity to sequester carbon. Through the NRCS program, farmers are incented for keeping those wetlands as wetlands and farming around them but not impacting those wetlands. So it's a voluntary program, but it's engaging landowners in understanding the importance of their lands for carbon uh, sequestration and animal habitat. Other examples uh, in agriculture using cover crops that hold soils and retains nutrients while also sequestering carbon. Uh, very effective programs to change the timing and the placement of fertilizers. So less is used, it lowers the input cost for farmers, but it also reduces greenhouse gas emissions. So the strategies within the agricultural sector alone have reduced net emissions by 120 million metric tons of CO2 a year. That's equivalent to taking another 25 million cars off the road. Within the Department of Interior, we have a lot of public lands. Roughly 20% of the land mass of the United States is within the Department of the Interior. And much of that are swamps and wetlands in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We now understand that these are some of the most effective carbon sinks out there. And so we are re-wetting peat uh, uh, soils. We are stopping those peat soils from drying out. It's reducing the risk of fire. It's also enhancing those wetlands as carbon sinks and as uh, productive places for, uh, for wildlife. I've done this in the Great Dismal Swamp large wildlife refuge between Virginia and North Carolina where water control, control structures are keeping those peat soils wet and uh, helping contribute to, uh, to um, carbon reduction. Nationally, we have a national seed strategy. When you have fire that ra rages through the landscapes and with climate change we're seeing more and more uh, wildland fires, what will replace those native ecosystems are invasive grasses, like cheatgrass, which comes originally from Africa, that enables the fire cycle, uh, produces more carbon, and doesn't stabilize the soils or provide healthy habitat. So having the right seed at the right time, in the right place, enables us to replant with native habitat to reduce the impact of those invasive species. And we are seeing invasive species, of course, in all countries around the world. So we're proud of these efforts and also very proud of the leadership in this space that's coming from many countries around the world. And we're fortunate to have three very good examples of this with us here today. So I'm going to uh, introduce each panelist before they come up, and they're gonna do brief presentations, and then I'll moderate a q and I will invite questions from you in the audience. Tom will also be checking the Twitter feed to see if there are questions coming in, 
and I know that uh, Dr. White from Gabon has uh, school children that have been sending him questions uh, while he's here, so maybe we'll get a few from uh, the children of Gabon as well. So uh, without further ado, um, I would like to introduce our first panelist, and that's uh, Dr. Daniel Murdiasso from Indonesia. He serves as the principal scientist at the Center for International Forestry Research and is a professor at the Bogor Agricultural University in Indonesia, where his work focuses on land use change, climate change mitigation, and adaptation. Dr. Murdy Arso has played the role of lead author and review editor of a number of IPCC assessment reports and publications, including working with the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize winning IPCC. He served uh, the government of Indonesia as the deputy minister of the environment in uh, early 2000s, during which he was also the national focal point for the UNFCCC. And he will talk about Sustainable Wetlands Mitigation and Adaptation Program, or SWAMP, which is supported by USAID and implemented by the Center for International Forestry Research uh, and the U.S. Forest Service. SWAMP provides policymakers with credible scientific information needed to make sound decisions on the role of tropical wetlands in climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Daniel Murdiarso. Thank you, Secretary uh, Jewell. Um, she mentioned a number of times uh, SWARM. In fact, that's the name of our project or program, the Sustainable Wetland Adaptation and Mitigation Program. And we cover a very broad uh, geographic uh, entity uh, globally. Uh, we work in 25 countries dealing with mangrove and peatland. So these are the very important wetland ecosystem that we're concerned about. So the way we do it, is by having partnership with colleagues in various countries that I uh, showed here. And these countries are really countries who have the potential to use coastal landscape as means of mitigation action. So uh, taking into account the, the issue of national circumstances, we'll see what the national circumstances in terms of the capacity, in terms of the challenges they have as I uh, describe it. So I would like to acknowledge the contribution of my colleagues from U.S. Forest Service and uh, the Oregon State University, who's been very kind to contribute the materials for this presentation, as well as the work in the field in the past three or four years. The, the way I organize this talk is basically looking at coastal uh, landscape, namely wetland, coastal wetland, as a means of uh, mitigating climate change because this ecosystem had a very huge carbon stock uh, across uh, the tropics as we go along uh, inventorizing and uh, doing the measurement with the protocol that we designed before we collaborate with our partners. Secondly, it's also important when people come to an issue of uh, generating co-benefit from the ecosystem. There are many ecosystem services that this wetland ecosystem can provide but in many cases, uh, they are separated in, in the way the restoration uh, is uh, carried out with regard to mitigation action. That is to say, uh, in this very ecosystem, we had a very opportunity to uh, bundle between adaptation measures and mitigation at the same time. So we can call it mitigation approach or mitigation-based adaptation, if you like, in the coastal zone. So while mitigating the emission of carbon dioxide and other gases, we can also improve the resilience and the uh, security of the coastal uh, ecosystem as well as coastal community. Um, let me give you some example to, to give you a flavor how these countries are facing the challenges. One is in uh, Africa. It's Mozambique is facing a tremendous challenge in terms of uh, coastal development, gas and oil exploration, and also infrastructure development, dam, and those things are affecting the coastal ecosystem, namely mangrove. And the challenge here is that the stock in the ecosystem, the carbon stock in the ecosystem is huge. But if you remove the, the, the trees, 
and at the same time also remove the stock in the soil, then you will come up with very large amount of carbon being emitted from the particular ecosystem. You can see here the uh, stock in the soil is much, much bigger than the tiny trees that you can usually see in, in the mangrove ecosystem. They are small trees, but very highly productive in terms of uh, net primary production that can be stored in the soil. Similarly, in Indonesia, as the largest uh, mangrove in the world, a quarter of the global mangrove reside in Indonesia. But it's faced very tremendous challenge these days as we have a large scale operation in terms of agriculture or aquaculture development. And the rate of uh, deforestation is somewhere around 50,000 to 60,000 uh, hectare per year. So every week we will be losing around 1,000 football size of mangrove in the past 30 years. So that's quite staggering because of coastal development. In the Dominican Republic, the same issue happens uh, with regard to uh, coastal development. It's also aquaculture. And the, the carbon stock left that we assess there is somewhere around 11% of the original amount, which was somewhere around 80 to 90% uh, due to the excavation of soil as the fish and shrimp pond are established. The same thing in India. Although the, the tiny um, mangrove uh, near the bitter, um, uh, Sundarban, India, they are very important uh, sanctuary for wildlife. Uh, the, the amount of carbon is not that huge compared to the three countries I mentioned, but the importance for biodiversity is, is amazing. So uh, with that information in mind, we, we just completed our work with the mapping. Uh, we've been working day and night uh, to produce this map since two years ago. And I think some of the people who are working on it is in this room. And we are very pleased to announce the, the uh, new pantropical peatland and wetland map that is going to be available publicly. Uh, we can see here the uh, various uh, wetland, including peatland, that can be mapped, and also uh, mangrove. Uh, we use a very uh, interesting uh, uh, legend here, which is coming from the, in, uh, the uh, uh, Japanese artists, uh, to show how the model was established uh, using the rainfall and then the tidal rains for the mangrove uh, ecosystem and flooding system to look at the uh, excessive water in the landscape. So water balance model was used in a moderate uh, scale of, of satellite imagery. So it will be available for uh, public to, to look at it. If you zoom it in, in three different uh, continents, you can see here the um, Peruvian Amazon is flooded uh, most of the time, and we, we observe the submergence, subsidence of the landscape. And you can see here the wetland extensively in the upper part of, of the Amazon in, in Peru. And also in um, uh, West Africa, you see the Gabon, um, sorry, the uh, Congo Basin is affected by high rainfall. And we can capture in the model that uh, peat swarm is observed there, including the, the flooding or floodplain area. In Indonesia, it's mainly dominated by peat dome, where very thick, um, up to 20 meters of peat are established, and that's contain a lot of carbon. And we also um, model and, and show the, the mangrove in the coastal zone using the tidal model. So in general, uh, we have numbers of area of wetland, including peatland, uh, that we can demonstrate uh, that this is a very uh, moderate um, scale in terms of, of uh, spatial resolution. And when countries are encouraged to do assessment and reporting, and MRV is very important as far as projects are concerned, but also for the reporting system within the UNFCCC, uh, scheme and the availability of 2013 uh, supplement for the UNFCCC uh, guideline is, is there. So having a map like this will be very crucial to
for country to utilize and estimate the change in land use. And that is also to estimate the activity data in addition to the emission factors that we generate with countries where we're working with. Now, coming to the issue of resilience of the coastal zone, um, the IPCC also predicted the um, climate change in the context of sea level rise. Um, if you pick up uh, the highest scenario called um, RCP 8.5, um, that's the representative uh, concentration pathway, high uh, scenario that will cause the increase of sea level which affect coastal zone up to one meter in uh, 2100. And the lowest one using the, the low scenario uh, RCP 2.5 is about 20 centimeter. So we gather a lot of information from published uh, data and looking at the impact of sea level rise from various treatment or um, activities in the coastal zone, uh, we can demonstrate that uh, if you look at this uh, the graph, the uh, diagram, the top panels are the, the coastal zone which are in the interior side, and then the, the bottom panel is those are those who are in the fringe close to the ocean. And then that's A and B and C and D. And A and C are the low scenario using RCP, uh, RCP 2.5, and uh, B and D using RCP 8.5. It is demonstrated that in 2070, the fringe mangrove can, sorry, the, the base in the interior mangrove can no longer survive from sea level rise, but the uh, fringe mangrove is even worse. It's only survived up to 2055. So this message tells us that um, it is important to introduce restoration using the proper way in understanding the ecosystem. Most of the restoration at the moment is just planting trees without knowing what's the requirement for that ecosystem to, to survive. And uh, we try uh, a number of models uh, using this particular ecosystem and looking at the uh, deposition of carbon um, that we can track down to 200 years ago uh, using the decay mechanism of lead to 10. We expect to be able to predict what's going to happen and test the model that we, we showed before. Uh, if the um, coastal zone will survive or if any treatment are required to help mangrove and coastal zone to build the land to cope with a sea level rise. So restoration is going on a lot in the uh, coastal zone and usually they are also incorporating activities like ecotourism, uh, food and wood production as well as um, fishery. And these are very local. These are national or even local circumstances, circumstances that we need to take care of. Uh, there is no one bullet or one size fit all in, as far as restoration is concerned, especially if we are combining it with uh, mitigation action. There are a number of models, um, but th most of the time people tend to have broader or larger size of pond so that they can produce more fish, but ignoring the mangrove so that uh, the cycling of the nutrient will be, will be affected. So that will affect also the lifetime of the pond. So we, we try to, to work with the local to see uh, how the, the best model that they can adopt in this uh, situation. We provide the uh, uh, guidelines so to do that and basically uh, also to um, use the, the IPCC guideline to, to, to report on the, on the carbon stock at the same time. So my last uh, slides, if you look at mangrove in the middle of what is being discussed here and the month before, Sustainable Development Goal, SDG, there are 17 goals, only one which is not associated with mangrove. It means that mangrove is so important for Sustainable Development Goal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Morty Yarso, and uh, I know that there's much work going on with regard to mangroves around the world, and uh, thank you for that illustration of where it can be used. Next up is Dr. Lee White.
He's the director of the Gabonese National Park Service, and he's advisor to the president. Uh, I've met multiple times with the president of Gabon. Gabon is a leader in recognizing the value of its forests and its ecosystems, not only for the health of its animal species, but also for the economy of the nation. And uh, Lee has been a tremendous champion in those efforts. He's responsible for the protection, the management, and the development of national parks and geotourism. He's been deeply engaged in uh, negotiations for a number of years, not only at home, but also on, uh, in the climate discussions for the country of Gabon. So he's going to speak to the work Gabon is doing on holistic land use planning and management as part of their economic development efforts. The U.S. has been pleased to support Gabon's efforts through many programs, including one like the Silva Carbon and Enhancing Capacity for Low Emission Development Strategies. So please join me in a warm welcome for Dr. Lee White. Thanks, Sally. Um, hello, everybody. I'm going to, it's, it's actually quite a luxury for me to speak in English. I, I usually do these in French. I had to translate my translation for uh, my, my presentation for this. Um, you can see uh, behind the text there a typical Gabonese landscape. Gabon is 88% covered by tropical rainforest. So in terms of percentage, we're the second most forested country on the planet. Over the last 15 years or so, we've, we've worked through a, a, a planning process to develop new economic models and new management models um, to enable us to develop Gabon whilst also maintaining our, our rainforests. Um, just as an indication of how we're doing, uh, through the, 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 the passing of a, a forestry law in 2001, which obliged forestry companies to move towards sustainable development, through the creation of a national park system in, 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 in 2007, when we, when we look at carbon emissions between the period from 1990 to 2000, and then between 2000 and 2010, through our, our, our land use planning and our sustainable forestry programs, we've calculated that we, that we saved something like 350 million tons of CO2 um, in that second 10-year period. Um, in, in, in some ways, you might say that, that Gabon was doing red before, before red existed. That's a picture of the country with the, the 13 national parks that were, were finally created in 2007. And as we think about the future, we're, we're, we're thinking about how do we consolidate on those gains? Um, how, can, how can Gabon as a forest country continue to develop the country, continue to create jobs, and continue to sustain um, forest cover in the, um, hopefully in the high 80s? rather than going through that, that, that deforestation curve that you see in, in most countries as countries develop, um, just looking across to our neighbors in West Africa, um, we've lost almost all of the forests of West Africa as West African countries' populations increase and, and countries develop agriculture. Um, so how can we avoid doing that in the Congo Basin? Because if, if we don't, um, vast amounts of CO2 are going to go up into the atmosphere. It's going to have uh, a significant impact on our global efforts to deal with climate change. And it's also probably going to have significant impacts in terms of, of weather patterns in, in Central Africa and, and out into the Sahel in countries which are already climatically very challenged. So we've been through a process, and, and actually there's, there's a talk today at 1.30 in the Gabon Pavilion about the, the National Land Use Plan. We've been through a process of, um, since Copenhagen of creating what we call our Plan Clima, a national climate plan. Um, the climate plan basically took the national development strategy from the Ministry of Economy and, and integrated the, the principles of low carbon development into every one of our economic sectors. So into the forestry sector, but into the oil, oil sector, the agriculture sector, the, the industrial sector. 
Um, we, we then created a sustainable development law. So the parliament passed a sustainable development law last year in 2014, um, which sets into law in many ways the gains that we've made over the last 15 years and obliges every company, every administration, um, every year to do a sustainable development assessment to work out what our impacts are on climate change, but also on, on, on bio biodiversity and a term that we, we coined from, from His Royal Highness Prince Charles, um, um, the, 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 the human capital, the, the, the um, uh, sort, of, sort of a measure of human well-being within our sustainable development law. And, and, and uh, the, the final step in some ways in, 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 in being able to respect um, engagements that we've made here at the UNFCCC to reduce emissions across all of our sectors by at least 50% um, to maintain our forest cover is a national land use plan modeled slightly on, on the national parks which were created back in 2007, which uniquely for Central Africa are parks created by law. In most Francophone countries, protected areas are created by presidential decree, which is something that's relatively easy to change. You can change it through a process within the, the cabinet of, 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 of the government. Um, when you create parks by law, it obliges you, if you want to make any changes to the limits of those parks, to go back to the parliament and request permission from parliament to make changes. And so we're looking at that same process for our national land use plan. We've been through a process over the last three years to, to, to and it's more complicated than we, we it, it should have been, I guess. We've been through a process of compiling all of the different land use, um, you know, kind of mapping data. Um, we discovered to our horror about three years ago that we actually had eight different national land use planning processes in six different ministries as well as in the Prime Minister's office. And one ministry actually had two different land use planning um, initiatives that were underway. So we've brought all of those eight initiatives into one central initiative um, coordinated by the, what we call the Secretaire General de Gouvernement, the, 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 the central government. Um, and so we've, we've, we've produced what we're calling our Plan Zero, the, 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 the first time in the history of Gabon where we have every single forestry concession, protected area, oil concession, mining concession, mapped out properly in a GIS system, and now publicly available online so, such that the Gabonese public or the international public can consult where all the different con um, concessions within Gabon have been awarded. We're now going into a, 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 a second stage of our national land use planning, which is an, an optimization stage. We've, we, we, we have a very good um, picture now of, of all the different concessions that all the different ministries have given out to, to private sector and all the different protected areas and so on and so forth. What we're now trying to do is to think about um, how do we optimize national land use planning such that we can, you know, as I've already said, develop the country whilst maintaining forest cover and maintaining um, the, the, the very significant biodiversity that Gabon is, is home to. And so within my department, we're, we're looking at how do we plan um, to integrate all of the different aspects of biodiversity into this land use planning um, exercise such that we don't go and put um, a logging concession, for example, on top of a very rare habitat full of endemic species. Um, we've been through a process of, of compiling all of the data on individual species. Um, uh, we don't have perfect data. The forests of Gabon are, 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 are vast, impenetrable. There are not that many scientists out there. Um, and we're discovering new species for science, maybe not every week, but every month. Um, we just found a, a, a new plant species, um, new for science, which is about 12 minutes from the l airport in downtown Libreville. Um, and so 
uh, we're, we're working with imperfect data, but we've looked at the distribution of amphibians and reptiles and birds and mammals. And what we're finding, um, we're looking at all of, identifying all the species of conservation concern, mapping out their ranges across Gabon. Oh dear, I've run out of time already. Let me, I might take one more minute. Um, what we're discovering is that a vast majority of the threatened species in Gabon are restricted to, to very small um, localized habitats. 20% um, of those species occur in national parks, but 80% are outside of the park. So we have a conservation planning exercise that we have to go through. And, and what we're doing now is creating synthetic maps where, where we're identifying on that map the red zones, which are the zones where you have species with very localized distributions, which are areas that we need to protect. And the green and yellow zones where, where uh, there is obviously biodiversity, but nothing very restricted and very rare. We're going through a process of trying to identify all of the, the different habitats in Gabon. Um, so we've come up with a, a national map of, of all the different habitats based on geology, forest type, weather and so on and so forth. Um, and, and in the same way, we're, we've identified the, the very specific habitats that, that, that are highly localized and which appear in red on this map, which are, again, areas that we're going to try and avoid um, development that would denature those habitats. We've done the same thing for wetlands. So we've, we've gone through a process of identifying all of the wetlands, which, which again, we're going to try and avoid developing. We've looked at international data sets like the, the, the maps that Greenpeace and so on have created of, of intact landscapes. And we've come up now with a, it's, it's still a work in progress, but a, a draft map of, of where are all the, the places that we really need to, to pay particular attention and where are the places in Gabon where if we want to develop agriculture or, or, or more intense forestry, that we can do so without um, significant conflicts with, with, with biodiversity. And because we're at the UNFCC, we, we think of Gabon's forest as a lot more than just carbon. We find this, 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 this fixation on carbon to be slightly um, worrying. You know, the forest in Gabon, it's, it's our home, it's our hospital, it's our temple, it's, 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 it's where we live. But we've, we've been through the, the, the carbon mapping processes. We've mapped out all of the high, high carbon forests. Um, we have a national carbon map now and a national monitoring program. Um, and so we're going through the process of feeding all of that data into the national land use plan such that we come up with an optimized system to preserve all of the different habitats and all of the different species as far as we possibly can. Thank you. That's. Well, done. Sorry, well, thank you so much, Dr. White, for that uh, presentation. I think we can definitely see one country that is committed to landscape level planning, countrywide planning, so that's, that's quite extraordinary. I just asked our organizers, there's a lot of noise coming from this corner, like uh, recorded, I don't know if it's, um, if there's a way to turn something down over there that's making noise, thank you. Um, our next speaker is Giovanna Valverde Stark. I hope I pronounced that all right, okay. Giovanna works for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Costa Rica. Costa Rica, a country I have visited as an eco-tourist, uh, I think over 50 national parks, is that correct? Large part of the landmass, an incredible example in Latin America of understanding the value of ecosystems and open spaces. She, is, uh, she just came from the negotiation, sort of slid in under the wire before the panel, and uh, has a lot of hats going on at this particular conference. So we're delighted that she uh, took time to join us for, for this session. She's a diplomat, she's an economist, she's an MBA, she's a master of microfinance, and she's a climate change specialist. She's worked on wind energy projects in Italy. She's worked at the Central Bank of Costa Rica. She's worked as a diplomat in El Salvador and Belgium is a senior advisor to the Ministry of Agriculture and is lead negotiator and head of delegation to the, in the UNFCCC during the past three years and uh, of course actively doing that right now. So she's going to speak with us today about Costa Rica's actions in the livestock and coffee sectors to which the United States is pleased to have been able to provide support through the Enhancing Capacity for Low Emission Development Strategies Program. Um, 
in my own visits to Costa Rica from the Caribbean side to the Pacific side, the mountains to the coasts, uh, it's an extraordinarily diverse country and a country that is doing a great job of embracing that diversity. So with that, please join me in welcoming Giovanna Valverde Stark. Thank you so much, Secretary Jewell. I'm just uh, watching if, if we're going to be able to have the presentation. Or, or Here we go. Um, well, thank you so much, all of you, for being here. It's uh, an honor for me to share with you a bit of the experiences that we've had in my country um, in terms of what we're doing in mitigation and specifically in the agriculture sector. Um, we were invited to participate in this event to share what we're doing beyond forests. I think, um, if you don't know it, I will share this with you, but back in the, in the 80s, my country had a deforestation uh, level of almost 70%, and we have reverted that uh, process, and currently we have 52% of our country with forest uh, coverage. Um, what we hope to achieve is uh, increasing that up to 60% in the next uh, five years, and uh, we know that the only way we can achieve this is through uh, working together between the forest sector and the agriculture livestock sector. And the reason I give you this introduction is because in uh, our national inventory of, um, of green gas house, green house gas, sorry, I think in Spanish, English, too much confusion. Uh, our first emitting sector is transportation, as is for many countries, but the second one is the agriculture and livestock sector. Uh, with 38%. And of that 38%, almost 80% comes from the livestock sector. So you can understand why this is a, 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 one of the most important subsectors in which we've decided to start working. Uh, about four years ago, we decided to develop our nationally appropriated mitigation actions, and we're the first country in the world to do so by defining um, a compromise to do this with the coffee sector, which is what I was going to, and what I'm going to speak to you specifically about, our Coffee Nama, uh, which we launched three and a half years ago. No, yeah, uh, in a COP uh, in Doha. And uh, it was first um, Nama in agriculture to have been launched. And we also launched one year later our Livestock Nama. And I was the coordinator for that project, which is really quite wonderful. And in that regard, as, as you uh, mentioned, Secretary Jewell, we really thank the support that we got from, from the US, USDA specifically in terms of uh, Easy LEDs, which is a, a program specif specifically for low emissions development strategy. So I just wanted to give you that broad picture, but uh, just so you know, the focus of this presentation is not as scientific or detailed as my previous uh, uh, the pre my, my predecessors in their presentations. Um, I just want to share with you what we're doing in the coffee sector because I think it's a very um, particular and interesting case uh, that now I know many other countries are following our, our lead and um, for example, Colombia and other African countries that want to uh, use this, this type of mitigation strategies or low emission development strategies in their countries in the agricultural um, sectors. So, let's see. Is this correct? Yeah. So, when we began this process of the, of the NAMA in the coffee sector, uh, our objectives were obviously uh, beginning the concept of, of mitigation actions but we also knew it was important uh, to have co-benefits co in terms of adaptation, mitigation, and finally, at the end of the day, to uh, increase productivity or the financial resources that the producers could eventually have. If they don't have that kind of incentive, obviously, it's more complicated to get the, the producers involved in this process. Um, so basically, we began this. Um, almost four years ago and involved all of the coffee producers in our country, over 50,000, 236 coffee mills, uh, 62 uh, exporting houses, 73 roasters, um, and basically 
all of the, the coffee producers belong to different co-ops. So that made this whole work a lot easier to get all of the producers in our country uh, involved and convinced that this was something important, not only for them individually, for their families, for the resources, but also in terms of being able to add to Costa Rica's uh, proposal back from 2007 of being a carbon neutral country by 2021. So we decided to begin in a small scale uh, with the coffee sector, then livestock and then so forth. But I want to share with you this story of how we beca began in a small scale and have been moving up more and more. This is the life cycle analysis of what uh, we have determined in terms of the, of the coffee value chain. And as you can see, we have 50% on the production side, 50% on the, co on the consumption side. And uh, so the idea is that when we talk about anama in the coffee sector, you are talking about everything from when you plant the, the, the plant in the soil, and you, then you have to begin with especially the use, improved use of nitrogenated fertilizers, because as you can see there, it represents 45% basically of the weight in terms of emissions from, from the coffee production. Then you have the energetic water and waste usage, um, the fuel to transport it, uh, and then on the side of the consumption side, energy required to prepare it and um, the waste for methane. So what we did um, since this process began, this is a little bit of what I, I mentioned at the beginning, but in terms of Costa Rica's emissions, you can see there energy and transportation are the first one with 45%. And of that 45%, I would say like 37 are from transportation because in energy, you might have heard as well, we are actually quite efficient with our uh, renewable energies and, 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 and clean energy matrix. Second sector is agriculture and livestock. Third one is waste and fourth one is industrial process. And in terms specifically of the agricultural livestock sector, the first emitter is the livestock sector. Then we have coffee, uh, banana, sugar, and rice. So when we launched our NAMA, it um, was a work that was determined initially with pilot farms. And uh, for this, also we participated in a process that the NAMA facility launched. And we were one of the top three countries in Latin America that were chosen to, to be part of, the, of this NAMA process. Um, and as uh, Secretary Jewell mentioned and, and different, the, the other two panelists, I think MRV is probably one of the most crucial uh, issues for most countries in whatever strategy, uh, plans, programs uh, you may have. And so that was also the case for us. Um, but, uh, slowly but surely, with, um, with, the, with the pilot uh, farms, we were able to, to start keeping the, the monitoring registry and, and validation of, these, um, of all the processes that needed to be done, particularly with the fertilizers. Um, let me see here. So, as I mentioned, we focused on um, the MRV, and especially in the First, on, in the farms, in terms of the fertil fertilization use, then in the mills, by trying to find um, byproducts that could make the whole process more efficient. And this was done specifically with the gasification uh, and the methane of the water. But I will show you that so you can understand this better. So the, we began our MRV by doing, in the farms, the process of the soil mapping, um, understanding the unnecessary doses of the fertilizers um, and trying to determine what would be an, an, an important or relevant substitute for that and the importance of agroforestry. So this also um, helped us become this whole process of agroforestry and coffee in Costa Rica or shaded coffee, um, which ties into what I mentioned before. If we want to increase our our forest coverage in the country, we have to do that in the agricultural area. And uh, coffee is not uh, an exclusion. In fact, it has proven to have trees or shaded coffee improves resilience to climate change. 
And um, uh, so that's, that's one of the reasons we have focused completely on, on, on um, the agroforestry there. Uh, we also, this is part of the, all of the farms that are now part of this process is um, transforming the pulps into pellets, pellets into gas, gas into energy, which in the mills means you are reducing your electricity costs and mis minimizing your methane emissions. Also, the water that's used in the treatment plants um, is now being used to spray the areas around there because before you had uh, water lagoons to oxid that caused oxid oxidization and hence also methane emissions. So now we're using this type of um, specific action which has also re reduced significantly our emissions in the coffee sector. So what do we expect uh, from the Nama coffee, which is also uh, programmed for the next 15 years is to have a um, 30,000 ton CO2 per year reduction, carbon sink potential of 90,000 tons of CO2 per year, 120,000 until 2024, and overall we expect 1.8 million tons um, of CO2 equivalent, uh, which may not seem like a lot compared to other countries, but considering my country with four, 4 million inhabitants, it is, it is pretty significant. So we have focused, uh, basically these are the four uh, areas that we have focused on in our NAMA, which are governance, uh, and for this we have um, our national climate change strategy, which has been in place for the past eight years, uh, direction of climate change, we have a climate change law in the parliament right now, which we hope will be approved soon. Um, the NAMAs have or helped us to orient and define our ambition in the country of how far we can go in terms of reducing our emissions. We want it to be transformational. We are aiming at having a country that is a, a, a development path that's focused on decarbonization. That's our objective and our plan for the next 50 years. And with the NAMAS, what we want is scaling and rep replicability um, within my country, but also that this may help to replicate in other countries that are also um, focused on coffee or in livestock. So with this, uh, I would finish, but um, if anybody would like to ask more questions, uh, when we open up now for questions and answers, I'm more than happy to share on what we're doing in the livestock sector because I think there are a lot of interesting opportunities there as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Giovanna, and uh, all of our speakers. It definitely shows that across the world from Indonesia to Africa to Central America, we have uh, great examples of understanding the complexity of ecosystems and the benefits of these ecosystems in so many ways from economic development to uh, habitat for species, to carbon sequestration. And of course, it's a complex topic, uh, and it deserves complex solutions. And I can't think of three finer examples than the three we have up here today. Uh, so with that, we are ready to open up for questions. We're running a, a little bit behind, but we've got uh, five minutes before the session officially ends and really 10 minutes before we need to vacate the space for the next speakers. So I'd like to start by seeing if there are any questions from the audience, and we'll run a microphone over to you. Questions out there? All right, while well, you're conjuring up your questions, we have any from Twitter yet? And if not, I'll start asking my own, because I always have questions. <laughs> okay. Well, let me start uh, with one here. I think uh, we've heard a, a number of examples, particularly from Lee, about uh, policies and, you know, land use plans you found were, uh, you know, somewhat disparate. You're bringing them together on a national scale. I'd, I'd love uh, all three of you to talk a bit about the policies that you've seen in, in your country or other countries that hinder or help uh, efforts to recognize the value of ecosystem services and the things that we've talked about. So uh, anybody like to jump in and talk a bit about uh, policies that have helped, policies that have hindered, and suggestions that you might have for the group broadly? Yeah. Well, I, th I think in, in the case of Costa Rica, what really um, helped in terms of policies that can, in fact, um, help protect ecosystems is taking climate change as a transversal, transversal um, um, 
idea, topic, uh, whatever you may call it. Uh, and we began doing this like three years ago and in the Ministry of Finance, the Ministry of Agriculture, Economics, everything we said, we have to bring everybody together and we can't just keep on thinking of climate change as something that is isolated and each ministry with their own agenda. So um, I think for us, that was really quite efficient uh, and sitting everybody down. Now we have a presidential climate change committee, a secretarial um, entity, and we have 14, 12 different ministries and institutions that participate in this. So for us, in terms of policy, I think that was really um, a key, a key, a key move. I, th I think I could almost replace the word Panama with Gabon. Costa Rica. Sorry, Costa Rica. Costa Rica, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, but I, I think what we're finding in Gabon is the key thing is transparency. And there's been a tendency uh, in the past for, say, the Ministry of Mines to be a little bit secretive about where they're putting concessions. But, but actually, as, as, as we make everything transparent and publicly consultable and so on and so forth, um, we find that taking biodiversity into consideration becomes something that everybody is you know, relatively positive about, as long as you're looking for for win-win solutions. Um, and so, as we as we move forward, we're, we're becoming more and more convinced that, that that improving public consultation and making these these decisions in a very transparent way is 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 the way to move forwards. Well, um, coastal zone and carbon in the coast is part of the bigger picture of blue carbon. But uh, blue carbon has problem when they are including uh, seagrass and, and also coral reefs because they might suffer from the forest definition. But as far as uh, coastal forests are concerned, it's, it's quite uh, timely to include mangrove into the uh, accounting system. Uh, into the MRV system because uh, the the tool is there, the IPCC guideline is available. Um, but I cannot, of course, uh, talk about other countries other than mine. Uh, looking at the policy perspective, it's, it's quite complicated in terms of who is handling mangrove in the landscape. At least there are two um, government agency or ministries who handle this, forestry and fishery. And they might have uh, a policy that are potentially conflicting, but needs some synchronization, especially on the production side as well as on the conservation side. So it's, it's quite a challenge to mainstream uh, mangrove into red mechanism. Thank you. We have a question from the audience? Okay, please. Please Great. let us know who you are. I, I know will. who you are, but they don't. I will. Thank you very much. Uh, Barbara Ryan with the Group on Earth Observations located in Geneva, Switzerland. So first I'd like to thank uh, you, Secretary Interior, and each of the panelists for great presentations. It maybe goes without saying, but following up that last question about policies, I'm wondering if each of your countries are, in fact, making sure that all of the data that's being collected is broadly and openly available. That's number one. And I think each of you are members of the Group on Earth Observations, so I'd love to connect you with the geo principles in your countries. And of course, one of the things that we advocate is the broad and open release of this data for transparency, like Indonesia just mentioned, and then also for economic growth. And so uh, really more of a comment, but just I'd like confirmation to confirm that everything you've presented is broadly and openly available for everybody to use, both within and outside the government. Thanks. OK, who would like to jump in? Giovanna? Uh, well, I think, for example, if you take um, the INDC, which I think was an, a wonderful uh, exercise in terms of um, being inclusive with civil society. I mean, in our country, we had to, we organized like 20 different uh, groups for weeks, transportation, industrial residues, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that that exercise was really useful because then it was they who had to, especially private sector, say yes or no, we agree with this INDC. Uh, yes, we can commit to reducing our emissions, you know, 
I don't know, 50% in transportation in the next 20 years. So um, in terms of that, of INDC and looking forward, uh, I can tell you that, yes, we were completely transparent and it was put on the website of all the different ministries and the presidential house so that also people could um, give their comments on, on that. So that's one, one issue and I think we're doing fine there. In the, thinking in, in retrospect of, for example, information and I'm thinking of things like the National um, Meteorological Institute and so forth, in my country that information theoretically is public. The problem that I find sometimes is that you don't know how to find it. Uh, so it's not necessarily that, you know, they're keeping, each ministry is keeping their information, but I agree that we should find um, some kind of a platform where one could um, share, share all this information. And I think that the INDC, as I said, really has been a mechanism to help us uh, th think through that process. Thanks, if, if I may. Um, actually, in Gabon, the INDC has been useful, but it's, in, in many ways, we, the INDC has been pulled out of these other planning processes that, we, that we've been through, so the, the land use planning and the climate plan and so on. Um, as I said in my talk, we've, we've, we've made all of the, the land use data public, so for the first time in Gabon, so it's, 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 a, it's a new exercise for us. We've also created um, an Earth Observation Agency, which is a, a geo partner, AGEOS, which is a kind of a sister agency to AMPN, and and one of the roles that they're playing is is actually monitoring from space the 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 application of, of this land use plan and making sure that we we stick to it and identifying any deviations from it. And um, there's now a partnership between the space agency and my agency. So if they identify anything that looks a bit unusual. Um, we're the ones that go out on the ground and, and check up on what's going on. Is, is it a gold mine that's just opened up? Is it illegal logging or, or so on and so forth? So all of that is both going out into the public sphere, but it's, you know, it's a nice example of, of, of uh, kind of agencies working together. If I might, before I pass the mic, I, I'm, um, as the secretary said, I'm, my kid's school did a mock cop before I left Gabon and so I had to stand up on stage and explain to them this process um, and then they went through a debate they had China and Gabon and the US and France and and and, and they um, made kind of proposals and debated them and now I'm stuck in a, um, a whatsapp um, forum where all the kids are sending me questions all the time, and I'm, I'm, I've promised faithfully that I will report back, so I'm sending photos back to Gabon of what's going on. And there's a lovely question from Carl Rambo that came in yesterday, and he says to me, is the delegate aware that focusing on keeping climate change below two degrees will have a big impact since many small island will disappear, spelt slightly strangely, uh, and the level of sea will reach a stage where many accommodations will be engulfed by water. However, we assume that keeping it around 1.5 degrees will be a big challenge, but still it's possible. Well, maybe a, a question to my, my friend here to the right. You know, there's a lot of concern in, 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 in Gabon that has a long coastline of, 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 of flooding and so on. So maybe to what extent can mangroves contribute to, to alleviating those sorts of problems? Sounds like a research question for PhD student. Yeah? <laughs> but uh, the way we, we work with partners across these countries, uh, including Gabon, uh, Senegal, Liberia, and the western coast of Africa, is really to use uh, the same protocol to assess uh, carbon stock in, in coastal ecosystem, especially in mangrove and use that as close as possible with the, um, the guideline the IPCC has, uh, meaning that we use the same compartments, five compartments to assess, and looking at the, uh, the, uh, the richness in, in various ecosystems, but also the, the cycling of this. And um, the capacity is there across these countries, 
And they are, of course, uh, very um, open and free to use the so-called um, um, the um, default value that the IPCC has in terms of emission factor. But uh, countries, most countries are very keen to have their own national specific emission factor. And we, we believe that this kind of investment in terms of capacity is very useful when they try to use or adopt the um, IPCC guideline in the next uh, reporting. Um, for Indonesia, I can uh, say more about the way the numbers are used. It was part of the uh, Red uh, Forest REL, FREL, and coastal zone and mangrove was included in terms of the activity data and emission factor. And it is reported to the UN FCCC Secretariat. And of course, countries are very keen to, to improve it in the future. But that's, that's the, the way the national process, as well as international training, is concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm going to wrap up this session. Um, particular thanks for sharing the question from the child in Gabon with a call to action for all of us. And I would say that uh, the example of young people engaging in a mock cop, I think that's really neat. That, that's a good illustration for all countries uh, for the next round. But the more we engage young people in, for example, planting mangroves, uh, planting wetlands, planting forests and trees, uh, engaging in rain gardens in their own community to capture stormwater runoff, um, being part of the solution, the more we will engage a future generation which is going to inherit this earth that is uh, in some trouble right now. The, the more we engage youth, the, the better chance we have to get to one and a half degrees as opposed to two degrees. So I think that we've got great illustrations of leaders within their own countries and countries that are doing uh, a lot of the right things. But uh, it also strikes me that as we have developed, we've taken away carbon sinks without even recognizing what we were doing. Engaging youth, uh, that next generation in this work, uh, as we're doing in the United States through youth conservation corps and through every kid in the park, which is providing a free pass to public lands for all fourth graders in America, gearing the curriculum toward understanding uh, the natural world, the cultural world, what's at stake, weaving climate change uh, into uh, those in, in many cases is going to help build a generation of young people that will uh, help solve these problems. And to Barb, who asked the question about open data and uh, the group on Earth observations, I was with them in Mexico City just a, a few weeks ago. Uh, you couldn't ask for more cooperation than the scientists at GEO in sharing open data, in building transparency, in providing lack of cover, I'd say, for countries that want to be quiet about this because it's all wide open and available. So congratulations to GEO on the 100 countries that were there that were part of Group on Earth observations. Transparency, working together, engaging the next generation, sharing examples on the ground of what we can do to uh, take care of these ecosystems that are so vital is, uh, I think, in all of our future best interests. So again, thank you for coming to the U.S. Center for this session. Please join me in a round of applause for our three great panelists. Thank you so much.